a lawyer with Pivot Legal Society. She was drawn to law by her belief in the law's power to build a more just society. She currently focuses her practice on litigating and researching the criminalization of homelessness, systems of housing which infringe the human rights and housing rights of low-income renters, and housing policies and practices that put women and families at risk. CJ will give the legal and human rights context to how our current housing systems impact marginalized renters and propose two things that cities can do to make a difference. Thank you very much, CJ. Thank you. Um, let me know if, if you can't hear me very well. I'm just getting over a cold, so I'll keep my distance from everyone. I thought I'd start by giving sort of a macro context to the human rights issues that really do arise when we start to talk about housing, uh, as well as the fundamental issue that we have here in Canada is that we don't talk about housing as a human right. And that is really the crux of what has brought us to where we are. Mm -hmm. So as many of you know, and you won't be surprised to hear, in international law, housing is considered fundamental to human rights. It's considered a fundamental need of every human being. And Canada is way behind in recognizing housing as a human right. And not only does that affect our place in the world, um, it affects how everyday people talk about what housing is. We don't talk about housing in a rights context. We talk about healthcare in a rights context. We talk about education. We talk about even equality rights as really fundamental rights that we all respect. But we leave out housing. So what that's left us with is being one of the only, made, only developed countries in the world without a housing um, strategy, a federal housing strategy. And in our governmental structure, that has really allowed all levels of government to effectively pass the buck in between levels of government over the course of the years and decades. So what we have is a federal government that has no interest in housing, a provincial government that has underfunded housing uh, projects and has really not taken a strategic and human rights view to what housing means for people over the course of decades. And we have municipalities who say, this shouldn't be our problem. The province and the federal government should be doing something, and we don't have the capacity to do something. So I'll start with that macro level. What does that mean trickling down, and what can cities, in fact, do? <coughs> if you start by looking at the failure to consider human right or housing as a human right, what that turns into is a fundamental basis whereby we don't have to provide things like rent control. If housing is not a human right, it's not something that everyone needs, and it is something that can be left to the market. <coughs> and that allows that loophole, that allows governments to effectively do nothing. And there are serious human rights implications to that failure. In BC, lawful source of income is a protected ground against which you cannot be discriminated against in your housing. Someone cannot say, I don't want to take you because you are on disability <coughs> income, uh, employment income, employment assistance income, welfare, whatever you want to call it, pension, whatever you want to call it. However, by failing to recognize that uh, housing is a right for everyone, we encourage landlords to do exactly that. If market forces are left only to, you know, um, to themselves, what we're left with is a market where landlords will want to discriminate against people based on their lawful source of income. And I'll give you sort of three brief case examples of what that looks like on the ground. One, what, um, one way that this manifests is sort of what you call the rent eviction. There we go. <laughs> um, the classic rent eviction is when a landlord is allowed to give someone a notice to end tenancy because they want to make uh, improvements to a space. What that turns into is <coughs> landlords evicting people without cause uh, so that they can make minimal changes to the space and raise rents exponentially by hundreds of dollars at a go. Um, and the reality is that most people don't know, they don't know first of all that there are, there's a human rights framework around discrimination that says you cannot be discriminated against based on your source of income. There's also a Residential Tenancy Act framework that says there's very limited reasons why someone can evict you from your home. 
But when someone gets that notice to end tenancy, very often, and very often for the clients that I deal with, it's a matter of where do I go next? What do I do? How do I survive? Not how do I take on the man? How do I right. fight back? So that becomes a real limitation for people, and that's one way that this manifests itself. A second way that, um, <coughs> pardon me. Second way that this manifests itself is through through rent increases, through targeted rent increases. So knowing that someone is on a fixed income and very specifically targeting them for a maximum rent increase over the course of years with the, with the absolute purpose of costing them out of their housing, making it impossible for them to stay. And when someone finally gives up and throws up their hands and says, I can't be here anymore, you can turn that apartment around and you can raise the rent as much as you want. And that is a reality for people who live in private market housing uh, and who are on fixed income. And the last example that we deal with is the so-called uh, mutual agreement to end tenancy. Under the Residential Tenancy Act, you can agree with your landlord that we'll end the tenancy and someone will get paid out a small amount of money. But when someone is being paid to move to the street, that simply doesn't work. Um, the amount of money that you make off of a mutual notice to end tenancy may last you a couple of days, a couple of weeks, even a month, but after that, being homeless is a lot more expensive. And the residential tenancy structure does not recognize that fundamental power imbalance between a landlord and a tenant. So that sort of brings me briefly, and I know that Sean will get into this in much more detail, but just to throw some ideas out there. We deal with this huge mega structure that says housing isn't a human right, so what do we do? And what can cities do when the federal government and the province aren't acting? What can a city do? Um, and I would say the first step is keep people in their housing. We spend an incredible amount of money talking about housing, talking about development, um, creating positions for people to advocate once someone has been removed, has been served with the notice to end tenancy. But taking that small amount of money and saying, if you are on fixed income and you are getting faced with an annual rent, maximum rent increase that is costing you out of your housing, we will provide you that subsidy. It's pretty low cost. Number one, it keeps people in their housing. And number two, it really highlights those landlords who despite having now the ability to capitalize on legal rent raises, are still choosing to serve people with notices to end tenancy. It highlights where the outliers are and it allows us to say, I think in this case people are being targeted because they're lower income. And the second thing a city can do is really take a global look at the impact that someone's having on a community when you grant permits. If you look at one building and you say, this building is empty, therefore we should give a permit to that developer, it is it completely ignores the context of a neighborhood if you don't then look around and say, but what have they done down the street? What did they do five years ago? What happened in this building? A city can take a strong stand and actually say, no, we are not going to grant permits to someone if we know and have known for years that you're one of these outliers. Um, and the city can make a difference, a real difference in that respect because there are people out there who will act within the law, who will respect people's human rights, and who do respect and understand that people on fixed income have a right to housing and they have a right to stay in that housing. So that's just a couple of ideas that I would throw out there. <laughs>